In this video, I'm going to show how to create a new Jetpack Compose project in Android Studio and push it to GitHub. I'll have a video that follows this where we go through some of the individual folders and some of the major files of the application. But for this, we just want to start a simple application and push it to GitHub. Also, I have a couple of other videos where I show how to initialize GitHub within Android Studio, how to create uh, essentially a, a key that you associate with GitHub and with Android Studio. So I've already done that. If you have not, I will point you to those videos first before you watch this one. But at this point, I'm assuming that we already are successfully logged into GitHub from Android Studio. So open Android Studio, and it happens to open to an existing project that I have. If you don't have any existing projects, you won't see this. You'll see a different welcome screen. I also have my current GitHub repository open. Uh, or GitHub space open. So you can see I have 57 repositories. And our goal is after this video we should we should have an additional one, or in other words we should have 58. So first I go into Android Studio and I choose File, and then I choose New Project. It brings up a screen here with several different types of applications I can start with. So basic activity is a traditional XML layout with a floating action button. Bottom nav activity has these different tabs on the bottom. And we have empty activity that essentially has nothing in it, add mobs activity, Google Maps. These are different things that we can add later to our application. So let's not worry about these just now. Login activity, I caution you uh, against using this one just because there's a better way to do login. And that's through Firebase authentication. And also you typically don't want to have a login screen as your first screen. I'd avoid that one just for those reasons. Think about what you actually want to do with your app. Several other options including primary detail, which is uh, good for tablets where maybe you have some nav on the left and then some main content on the right. Navigation drawer if you have a whole lot of screens. But there again, I caution you, uh, don't think about making an app with a lot of screens, at least not up front. Think about how much you can do with just a one or two screen app. So several other things that we can do, but here we're going to use a Compose activity, which is brand new. It's in, it just came out of beta as of the timing of this video. So we wanna do something new and innovative. We'll go ahead and choose Compose. I choose Next. Now application, we're going to call this one My Plant Diary. Be very careful about package name. Package name should be unique. So usually it's a domain name in reverse. You don't want anything personally identifiable in that package name, especially for a group project. Because consider if I made the group project and I called the package edu.uc.jonesbr, which is my user ID within the University of Cincinnati, what would happen if I were to leave the group and my name was still in the package? That wouldn't make a whole lot of sense. You also want to think about package name very carefully because this becomes your key on the Google Play Store. So for example, if we take a look at the My Plant Diary production listing, Notice the URL is play.google.com slash store slash app slash details question mark ID equals my plant diary. This is your unique identifier with the Play Store and it's where all of your ratings and reviews are associated. So that's why you want to pick this one carefully. If you change it, you essentially lose all of that history within the Play Store. So I'm going to call mine com.myplantdiary because that's a domain that I own. But I do create several different versions of this. So I might just give this one a V and then we'll go with the API level. Typically you want an API that's going to target a lot of different devices. So we see at the time of this recording, uh, Q will target about 50%, Pi 69%. But we do want to use some of the latest and greatest. So we're going to stick with 32, which I wouldn't do for a production app right now just because it's not widely available, but it will work for us. So I'm going to say V32 and then 001. Uh, we typically will start a package name with a letter, not a number. And typically the package name will be all lowercase. We don't tend to use dashes or anything else like that. We don't tend to use any uppercase letters at all, even like camel case. So you see my plant diary. Well, that's three different words. It's all lowercase. So I'm happy with my selection so far. And now I'm going to choose finish. We'll let it spin for a while as it creates our new project. Our new project is going, and you see it says Gradle Sync in project Progress, which means it's trying to build. We get a little uh, helpful hint here. I always like to take time to read those because I usually end up learning something new. Let's let the Gradle build finish. Now the build has finished. 
Before we do anything else, let's go ahead and commit and push this to GitHub so we have a clean state. We should only commit and push to version control when the application compiles. So when it's fresh out of the box and it compiles, that's a good time to do a first commit. Then we can do additional commits as we build additional functionality, and when we can use branches for work in progress so that our main or master branch is always a clean branch that only has features that are complete and meet the team's definition of done. So to add to version control, I'm going to choose VCS and then share project on GitHub. Now repository name's a little bit tricky because the repository name cannot have spaces, but it used our project name, which does have spaces. So I'm going to take the spaces out. I'm also going to add our version. We said 32 and then 001 because I might do multiple of these. Remote origin. We can have multiple remote repositories with distributed version control systems like Git and GitHub. And that's one of the advantages of distributed version control systems is that we can have multiple remote repositories. So we need to give them a name to identify them from each other. In other words, to make them distinct. Typically, the first remote repository we create is called origin. So let's go ahead and leave that the same. Description, I'll just say my plant diary Android uh, version 32 jetpack compose. Uh, that'll work. And then I'll choose share. We see creating GitHub repository, so on and so forth. Now it's asking me for an initial commit. And it's just saying, hey, here are all of the files that have been added. Well, it's a brand new project, so essentially all of these files have been added. One I want to point out in particular is git ignore. We'll take a look at that file in just one moment. Let me go ahead and choose add, and we'll work through this process to push to our GitHub repository. And we see it's successfully shared. So I can click on this, and it opens up my GitHub repository. And sure enough, you see here is disco spiff, which is my GitHub name, and then my plant diary v3201. Uh, if we go back to my GitHub homepage, I'm hoping to see 58 repositories. And sure enough, I see 58 instead of the 57 that were there before. You see I have one commit so far, which is this initial commit that we have. I also have only one branch, and this branch is master, or nowadays we're starting to call them main instead of master. But nonetheless, branches are very powerful in Git and GitHub, and as I go through and build this application out, I'll be building it in branches so that you can see each feature created separately without distraction. Back in Android Studio, we also see Git branch master, so we see we have the master here, and it also shows that we have master as a remote branch. We can create a new branch from here, or we can create a new branch from GitHub. Either way works fine. And when we do create new branches, we will see those branch options down at the bottom here. But at this point, I'm happy that I have a working project. Let's go ahead and take a look at that git ignore file. I'm simply going to hit shift twice and then git ignore. Looks like there are two git ignore files. We'll look at the one at root. So these are all of the things that we do not want to push to version control. Anything that's specific to our computer, anything that has maybe a, an absolute path on our computer, we don't want to push. Also, anything that is a built or compiled file, we don't want to push. So you notice the entire build folder is excluded here. Now the reason is, the way version control works is each commit is essentially a delta or a change from the last commit. And for source code files, it's easy to tell what changed. But if you change a line in source code and then you recompile, that compiled file is likely to look totally different, and it may be a large file. So if you were to push committed file, uh, compiled files, which we don't do, it would show a, a vast greater percentage of files changed than actually were changed just in source code. And the trick is, once over 50% of the project structure has changed, you get into what's called a multiple head scenario, which is a little bit tricky uh, to manage. So we don't want to do that. The other thing is, is that compiled files are just another translation of source code, really. And we want to save only one thing to our repository. We don't want to be redundant. We don't want to save the same thing twice. And because you could always rebuild, there's no real need to save those compiled files. Now, in this case, Android Studio was nice enough to create a git ignore file for us. But one thing that's interesting is if we start combining different technologies, we might need to make our own git ignore file, or we might 
do some other things where we can create our own gitignore file. When that's the case, I typically go to gitignore.io and I can put in whatever I'm using. So I can put in maybe Android Studio. I could do Android, Android Studio, Kotlin, anything else I'm using. I could add Java and it will create a gitignore file for us, which is quite robust. So that's a nice tool to have in your back pocket anytime you're initializing a Git repository. Now, everything looks good so far. I see I have my commits. I see I have my, my git ignore file. Just to make sure everything's good, I'm going to run this in the emulator. I have a separate video where I show how to create an emulator, and so I've already created one. If you don't have one, if this is your first time in Android Studio, I will simply point you to that other video that I have. But nonetheless, this AVD manager will show you all, show you all of your virtual devices. And one thing that I find handy, sometimes the virtual devices get locked up or it's hard to deploy to them. When that happens, I do a cold boot now, which essentially just erases any kind of memory it has. And then that makes it a bit easier to deploy. Now, we also want to make sure we have an AVD that is the same API level as we specified in the build.gradle. I actually noticed I didn't have a 32. I had a 30. So I paused the video for a moment and just created a new 32 version. I can see now that it appears that it wants to be able to deploy, so I'm going to go ahead and choose Debug Application. Debugger is one of the most powerful things that we have as software developers because it allows us to learn code that we didn't write by going through it at our own pace as it's executing. And the reality is in most of our projects we're working with others, and so we have to have a way to learn something that someone else created. In the real world, that someone else might have quit, that someone else might not be available. So the debugger is a really good skill to learn from someone when that person is not necessarily present. It'll take a few moments for this to load, so I'll go ahead and pause the video and we'll allow it to load. And we see now the emulator is coming up. There's a little bar here. I had paused the video, but there was a little bar here that showed the progress when it was installing the application. And here, sure enough, we see a screen that says, Hello, Android. If we go to our main activity and we go to split view and hit build and refresh and wait just a few more moments, we should see a very similar look and feel over here in the preview pane. And sure enough, here we see the preview. It's just showing us that one label, but nonetheless, that's fine. The preview is Hello Android. And that's possible because in Jetpack Compose, it can show us this preview here. We simply have to create a function to generate the preview and give it an annotation with the at preview annotation. We will see that and a whole lot more in the next video where I'm going to go over the structure of this application, the folders, and some of the important files. While we're here, let's try making a commit of our own beyond this initial commit. So I'm going to go to build.gradle, and I want to give you a scenario. Let's say in hindsight, the version 32 of the Android operating system might be a bit aggressive because we know it's not on a lot of hardware yet and we want to be able to make our app available to a wider audience and on the same note we also want to be able to test on multiple devices not just the latest and greatest as a matter of fact if you take a look in this drop down you'll notice that my api 30 emulator is incompatible and we get a warning that says min sdk is greater than device sdk of api 30. Well, okay, one option we have then is to change the minimum SDK and open us up to a broader audience. For that, we go to the build.gradle that is in the module My Plant Diary app. And it's as simple as changing this number here, the min SDK. And really, I think this is going to be a better option. I might even want to go back to min SDK 28 or so for both a wider audience and also just for more devices to test on. Now, once I made a change to this build script, the IDE recognizes it and it asks me to sync now, which means it's going to rebuild with this new configuration. This will take a few minutes, so I'll pause the video. The Gradle build is finished, and now take a look at our dropdown. You notice that the API is now, uh, sorry, the AVD is now able to run our project. And sure enough, when I run the project on my Android 30 AVD, it looks just like it did on the 32 version. So the min SDK change worked. Let's go ahead and push this to GitHub now. To do so, I'm going to go to the top of the project or the module called App. Now you see I have a new option that didn't used to be there called Git. And I'm going to choose Commit Directory. It will recognize any files that I have changed. And in this case, it says, OK, build.gradle. The others we're not going to worry about. I'll go ahead and say bump 
the minimum SDK version to 3.0. And now you see I have two options. One is commit, which is just going to store those changes locally on my com computer. The other is commit and push, which is going to store them locally on my computer and also push them to GitHub. Let's go ahead and choose the commit and push option. It does a quick static code analysis and it says no errors found and eight warnings. Probably a good idea to review. I'm going to go ahead and say push and then I'm going to look down here at the bottom to watch as it says it's, it's committed the files locally and now it's ready to push to my distributed version control system. Notice it's pushing from master then you have an arrow and then origin master. Now what does this mean? Master is our local master branch and then origin is that remote that we set up which is on GitHub. So it says it's, it's going to push this to origin and then the master branch on origin. That could potentially be a different name. Either of those could be a different name but the vast majority of the time you're going to be pushing to the same branch and usually as I said your first distributed version control repository is called origin. So the vast majority of the time you're dealing with master, it's going to look like this. If you were pushing to another branch, you would see that other branch name usually on the left and also on the right. Let's go ahead and choose push and then we'll take a look at GitHub. Back to GitHub, I navigate to the repository and you notice it says it's updated 10 seconds ago, which is a good sign. We also see here that there are now two commits instead of one commit. So let's click on bump the minimum SDK version to 30 and take a look at the change here. As with most version control tool tools, GitHub will represent a removed line in red and an added line in green. And here you can say it's given us a bit more intelligence because it says, well, actually, it looks like just this number was changed. So you see that has a little darker background in both the red and the green. So you can see quickly the line that was changed and you can see what was changed within that line. Now it focuses on this snippet, but if we want to see more of the file, we can click these up and down arrows and see more of the file. So we know now that our commit and push has succeeded. And that will take us to our next video where we're going to take a more in-depth look at this project and understand what a lot of these different files mean. So I hope this video was helpful. Stay tuned for the next. Thank you.